The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello and welcome to Short Circuit. This is Paul Sherman filling in for your regular host, John Ross. Joining me this week are Ricard Pakanawala and IJ Senior Attorney Bob McNamara. This week we have cursing drivers, revoked driver's licenses, and peeping police. Ricard, take it away. In this case, the Eighth Circuit affirmed denial of qualified immunity for the defendant police officer on his uh, and dismissed his uh, summary judgment motion on the plaintiff's claims of First Amendment retaliation and Fourth Amendment unreasonable uh, seizure for his arrest. Uh, basically, the facts of the case, the plaintiff shouted, F you, he said the whole word, um, out of his car window while driving on a busy highway um, at the defendant police officer who was 50 feet away. The officer had made a traffic stop of a van driven by a mother with two uh, children. The defendant then chased and arrested uh, uh, the plaintiff for unreasonable or excessive noise under the Arkansas state statute. Mm-hmm. And uh, he probably would have done that no matter what the guy. Right, ideal. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And you can see that Great by job, the... Great job, officer. <laughs> you can see that by the charges being, uh, uh, being soon dropped. Although he did have to stay in jail uh, several hours before they were dropped. So... Uh, First Amendment retaliation issues have been in the news recently because the U.S. Supreme Court uh, recently handed down a decision on these issues. Is that right? That is right. And uh, what the Supreme Court added was that uh, that if the defendant um, has probable cause or arguable probable cause for the uh, for the arrest for the warrantless arrest um, then uh, uh, then the plaintiff's claim is is no longer valid the retaliatory uh, claim oh, and, I mean one of the things that I think is interesting about this case and it, it postdates Nieves and the court acknowledges it in a footnote but I think a lot of people who follow the courts and I fall prey to this as well tend to think that Nieves is the the death knell for First Amendment retaliation because, as as Justice Gorsuch points out in his opinion, the police can always find probable cause to to arrest you for all manner of things. Uh, but this opinion illustrates that actually I think we're we're maybe giving the police a little too much credit. Like it is, of course, theoretically possible. A savvy lawyer can always find probable cause to arrest you for anything. But the actual charges the officer brought here uh, were based on the idea that the two-word shout con- constituted unreasonable or excessive noise. Uh, and the reality is even if you theoretically can find probable cause to arrest someone at any, at any moment, uh, officers on the ground who are engaged in illegitimate behavior aren't always going to be able to do that because the the two-word shout uh, turns out to, to not be all that excessive. But I wonder if this is just an example of an insufficiently creative police officer because we know that when the police are following a car – like invariably someone's going to have their tire touch the center line or something like that. So right. maybe maybe this cop should have just followed the driver for a little while longer and then under Nieves, uh, maybe he would have gotten away with it. Oh, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely yeah. true. But I also think that one thing we tend to gloss over is one of the, the relevant details there in figuring out how dire – circumstances are going to be is actually how creative the median officer is. And are there more people out there who are like Officer Paul Sherman, who would follow me for six miles and until I finally drifted within my lane? I would or, 100% do that. <laughs> uh, I mean, you follow me anyway. Uh, but Or are more people like Trooper Cross here who sort of leap to the first thing they can think of because all they really want is to put the guy in the jug for a few hours and uh, don't particularly care about what's going to happen when the case reaches the federal courts of appeals. One other one other quick point. Bob's mentioned the the police officer and, and his reaction. The other thing uh, that's interesting about this case is the court and the court's engagement. Um, this this is a positive example of the court actually looking at the, the, the facts. Uh, Bob's mentioned the two-word yell, uh, unamplified, didn't cause any uh, interruption in traffic flow or business 
businesses or, or any other complaints. Uh, so the court here does a good job of, of actually looking at the relevant facts. My concern is what about other courts and judges that are not as, uh, as engaged and really take uh, uh, maybe a slightly more creative uh, officer at their word and, and, and goes with that and says, oh, yeah, there's, the officer had probable cause or arguable probable cause. Well, and that, that may end up raising some interesting issues under uh, that part of the Nieves decision that kind of creates the safety valve where it says that uh, if police arrest you for something that they're not arresting other people for, then maybe you can make out the claim for retaliation. And uh, so maybe it requires a little more creativity than, uh, than I initially suspected. No, and it requires something more than, than creativity in the moment, or at least I think that's the, that's the hope the majority in Nieves clearly has, uh, that this isn't going to be an easily gameable standard. And ultimately, I think it's going to come down to how good at game playing uh, the, the median officer is, or at least the median officer who wants to engage in, in retaliatory arrests. All right. So a victory for free speech in the Eighth Circuit. Now let's move to the Sixth Circuit, where we have some revoked driver's licenses. Absolutely. This week's podcast is only about the law of automobiles. Uh, In John's absence, we decided to focus on what the people really want to hear, which is cars and things related to cars. And that brings us to the Sixth Circuit, where Adrian Fowler and Keisha Harris brought suit uh, against the Michigan Secretary of State, uh, alleging that both of the plaintiffs who represent a a putative class were subject to traffic fines uh, that they were unable to pay. And as a result of those traffic fines, uh, they were automatically subject to to the suspension of their driver's license, which caused all manner of problems in their lives, made it difficult to get jobs, to retain jobs, made it difficult for them to earn the money that they would need to repay the fine they own in the first place. Um, They sue, alleging that this violates their rights under the 14th Amendment to both due process and equal protection. Uh, And their claims are roundly rejected by the Sixth Circuit uh, in an opinion that's really interesting for the degree to which it's at odds with the the actual litigants themselves. Uh, Because what the majority of the panel wants to say is that there's no procedural due process problem here uh, because there's nothing that would happen if you gave these people a hearing in the first place. Uh, Michigan law says that driver's licenses are automatically suspended for non-payment, and that's the end of the matter, and so there's no need to have any process. And the problem the panel has is that both sides are pretty strident in insisting that, in fact, uh, there are indigency exceptions uh, and that if these two plaintiffs had only spoken up, uh, they would have been given, they would have been put on a payment plan, their licenses never would have been suspended. Uh, and it's it's an interesting look into how the government litigates cases like these, uh, because in response to this complaint, the government's first reaction was to say, there's no federal claim here, because if Ms. Fowler and Ms. Harris had just contacted the court and said they were unable to pay their fines, they could have been on a payment plan of as little as a dollar a month, and there'd be no problem here, and so there's nothing to see here, Your Honor. And the the panel rightly rejects that and, and hears the actual claim on the merits, but it creates a real problem when the panel then wants to be able to say that there there's nothing to discuss in a hearing uh, because it has to do so over the firm testimony of the actual people responsible that if only these people had had a hearing, they they would have gotten a better outcome. I wonder if that's uh, a reflection of the increased scrutiny that that governments and, and courts are now getting on uh, on these kind of cases regarding suspension of driving licenses uh, where where people are unable to pay and and there really isn't much uh, dispute about the fact that they that they cannot pay um, and, and that's really what's what's motivating uh, government in in litigating these cases. Mm-hmm. So this case is decided under the rational basis test. Yeah, so there's a procedural due process claim, uh, which is what we were talking about, about whether there had to be some kind of hearing uh, at which these women had the opportunity to express their indigency and uh, receive some kind of payment plan or just some sort of act of discretionary mercy, uh, which it seems like if they had known they could ask for, they almost certainly would have gotten. Uh, And separately, uh, the parties argue that there 
this is simply an irrational policy because suspending people's driver's license makes it harder for them to earn money, makes it less likely you're actually going to be paid back. Uh, to which the panel responds, that certainly sounds like an unwise policy, but it's uh, by no means irrational for the government to threaten to hit you with a really big stick as a way to incentivize you to behave better, uh, or at least to behave more like the government wants you to behave. Uh, on which theory there's really no level of punishment that the government could levy that would be irrational. As long as it's something people want to avoid, uh, people have an incentive to avoid it. What's amazing about that is it, it, the court says that it's, or the majority says that it's fine for government to use this, this stick to, to create a greater incentive, but then, but then acknowledges that the greater incentive doesn't actually lead to the result that the government wants in terms of uh, uh, the people to pay the, the court debt that they owe. So what is the what is the rational uh, basis there for increasing the pressure on someone to do something that they cannot uh, they cannot do and that there's no uh, dispute about that? Yeah, kind of a reminder that when courts use the word rational in discussing the rational basis test, they're not using the word in the way that normal humans use the word. Um, to mean you know something that's right. connected towards right. actually achieving your your goals in a meaningful right. way. Right, and and the majority's use of of the word counterproductive, I think, is the best example of that. If something is counterproductive, it's it's hard to see how it can be rational and counterproductive at the same time. Mm-hmm. So you you mentioned the majority. This this case drew a unique dissent. It did. Um, I mean, the dis- unique in the sense that there's only one dissent. Uh, you, you, unique in the sense that it's not just a dissent, Bob. If you read closely, it's a dissent because it has an exclamation, exclamation point, mark. which yes. I don't think I've ever actually seen. That's interesting. I noticed that too. Uh, it, it's interesting that it's right at the end. I, I thought it would be even more effective if the, uh, if uh, uh, Judge Donald had that right at the beginning of the dissent. But yes, uh, she, she could have actually put it at the beginning, uh, as we have seen in the Ninth Circuit. Judges can actually write anything they want when they describe their opinion, uh, and so it could very well have just been dissenting. Are we just talking about the exclamation point now? Oh, oh. <laughs> is this just the typography section? This is the car podcast, not the typography That's, section. No, good point. Good point. So, so anyway, uh, R- Ricard, let's talk about the dissent a little bit. What what's going on there? What is her objection? So, her objection, first off, is that the majority gets uh, the property interest. Uh, uh, analysis completely wrong, Uh, that the majority looks at the state deprivation procedure uh, uh, to say that, oh, there is no property interest for uh, indigents in uh, driving licenses if they're uh, in maintaining their driving license, if they're unable to pay a court debt. What what the Supreme Court, in fact, has said is that there is a continuing, uh, people have a continuing interest in maintaining a driving license uh, free from suspension. And and that is where uh, the analysis should have focused in terms of finding an actual uh, property interest uh, susceptible to 14th Amendment protection. And and once you have that, then the dissent says you move on to the Matthews versus Eldridge um, factors uh, to figure out what that due process should look like. And when you go through uh, the factors here, um, as as Bob uh, alluded to in the introduction, you, you can quickly see that, that some due process in terms of notice and a hearing uh, is, is, clearly, is clearly needed here. Um, so if you look at the factors of private interest, uh, what is the private interest affected? Well, here when you lose a driving license, and that is uh, the court finds a necessity in terms of uh, gaining employment, maintaining employment, uh, uh, feed, basically feeding your family and yourself, uh, then, then that's, a high, that's a high private interest. The risk of uh, erroneous deprivation is, is similarly high because uh, uh, you're talking about bringing financial ruin to uh, to an individual or family that that is unquestionably indigent, and the government interest, um, interestingly, in in this case, uh, the government interest is is very and burden is very low. The government uh, doesn't say, oh, it would be impossible or, or supremely difficult to provide a hearing. In fact, as as we heard, they say, oh, uh, the. The plaintiffs uh, would have gotten a hearing uh, on the on the underlying uh, the underlying charges and and claims. What they 
what they didn't get, however, was actual notice and an ability to bring bring their uh, inability to pay to the court's attention, and so have that uh, have that taken into account and 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 not have their license suspended. So one of the things that seems to separate the majority and the dissent in this case is different views about whether constitutionally protected property interests merit the same kind of protection as constitutionally protected liberty interests. That's right. Um, And the majority definitely makes that point in distinguishing uh, Supreme Court precedent uh, uh, Griffin versus Illinois and Bearden versus Georgia, which which, uh, focus on the fact that you cannot discriminate or states cannot discriminate against individuals simply because of uh, their poverty or lack of resources in order to punish them uh, more harshly. And the majority says, well, those are different cases because they're dealing with liberty interests, not property interests. What the dissent says here, and I think you could even build on this, is that the the given the the context and the situation here you really do have uh, a liberty interest at stake as well as the property interest the property interest is in the driving license but the liberty interest is in being able to uh, get to get to work keep your job uh, earn an honest living provide for your family uh, and access basic necessities all of which seem would strike me as uh, as affecting a liberty interest well, I mean really the liberty interest is the the liberty to drive around uh, and this is something that you see actually throughout licensing cases that licenses whether they're driver's licenses or business licenses or what have you are consistently treated by the courts as property uh, they're treated as property for due process purposes uh, for as we see here for equal protection purposes. Uh, And that's obviously true in a sense, right? Like a license is a piece of property, and if it's taken away from you without due process, that is a deprivation of property. Uh, But courts just glide right past the question of whether you have a a liberty interest in doing the thing that is being licensed. Uh, Obviously, in the absence of a state law making it illegal to drive without a license, uh, you would be able to drive or in the absence of a state law making it, making it illegal to braid someone's hair without a license. You would be able to braid people's hair. Uh, and so it's not just the property interest you have in the piece of paper or the laminated card or whatever it is that you have. It's the liberty interest you have in actually doing the underlying thing. And that is an aspect of licensing that in every constitutional context uh, seems to just get swept under the rug. And it's something that is not squarely grappled with by the opinions here, uh, but that I think is really a, a fundamental question that's just lurking under the surface here and just being glided past by presumably the, the litigants as well as the court. But it's something that I think bears a lot more attention. One uh, one point to add to that is some of the famous Supreme Court cases in this uh, area, including Bearden, arose, uh, the liberty interest arose because the person was actually being put in jail. So you've got a clear uh, example of a supreme deprivation of liberty. But that doesn't mean that, uh, kind of as we're discussing here, that there aren't other deprivations of liberty that don't involve you being just slammed in jail. Um, and that that also require uh, protection in terms of due process and should be taken seriously by courts. In fact, you would imagine they they would be taken seriously, but uh, but as the majority here seems to do, they focus on the fact that the person isn't being physically put in jail and the key being thrown away to say, oh, there isn't there isn't a liberty interest as as Bob described it, so we can just move to property and oh, property you don't get uh, for property interest you don't get the same. Uh, kind of due process and and throw it away. But uh, the other point is, even if there is a difference between the two, I don't think that necessarily means you shouldn't get any due process uh, as these uh, plaintiffs didn't seem to get on the on the in- indigency part of it. So I think that that's something that courts um, uh, certainly should take into account. Yeah, the, I think... Once again, this is just an assumption that undergirds a lot of federal jurisprudence, but there is this idea in the precedents that incarcerating someone is the maximal deprivation of liberty. And that's true in a certain sense. Like, obviously, we should take very seriously the the burdens we impose on someone when we incarcerate them. But there's also a sense in which that's a bit of just an artificial fiction. I mean, I think if you asked most people, would you rather spend one night in jail or would you rather never be able to drive again? That's a trade a lot of people would take. Uh, 
Uh, and I would take I would take that trade. <laughs> and so, just assuming that the one night in jail is categorically different, requires a different mode of analysis than we're going to prohibit you from driving around, is as, as a practical matter wrong, uh, and yet as a matter of law true. And I think that's a tension that could uh, could bear a little more attention. Yeah, well, and I, th- I think it's unlikely this is the last we're going to hear about this issue. I'm sure this is going to arise in other circuits, and maybe eventually the U.S. Supreme Court will weigh in. Well, ordinarily, this is an appellate podcast, but we ran across an interesting district court opinion. John Ross isn't here. We'll do what we want. That's right. <laughs> uh, out of the District of Massachusetts, Massachusetts. involving uh, some police who are very interested in what's going on at a particular house. Ricard, what's going on here? So what's interesting here is that the police uh, use a a secret um, camera, a video camera hidden in a utility pole uh, outside um, outside, uh, some people, the defendant's residence. And they were recording comings and goings, basically the driveway of the house and any comings and goings to the house. That included um, visitors' uh, cars and and license plates on those cars. The camera recorded all of that information. And it was uh, digitally recorded and could be searched and was uh, maintained for eight months. So for over an eight-month period, uh, the police had access to basically every second uh, uh, that anyone entered or left the residence and uh, uh, and through the license plate information could figure out who they were. Um, this was done without a warrant. So the question really for the court was, um, is this a search? Because if it's a search under the Fourth Amendment without a warrant, uh, then the defendant's motion uh, to suppress evidence uh, uh, would be granted. Now, it's not a physical search. That's the, that's the first way, the common law trespass uh, um, prong. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not that. So what we're really looking at, what the court is looking at here, is whether the government, uh, through this uh, video recording, is intruding on, a, on the defendant's reasonable expectation of privacy. So sub- do they have a subjective expectation of privacy? as well as an objective one, one that society uh, would, uh, would agree with and extend to them. So it seems like there's, there has to be a line here, right? Because on the one hand, the police can conduct a stakeout of a location and nobody thinks that, that that's a search within the meaning of right. the Fourth Amendment. Right. On the other hand, this court finds that if you maintain a camera for eight months uh, recording everything, that right. that is a search. Right. Um, so where's the line? How do we draw that line? Well, the court doesn't... Uh, doesn't draw a, a a super bright line here, but they certainly make that the distinction you point out, Paul, and and they give some reasons as to why this case is different from that kind of uh, stakeout or even following someone around for a limited period of time, and that gets back to uh, the the recording uh, in in most part uh, a recording over that long eight an eight month period. Uh, without a warrant, and that that's capable of uh, the government is able to go back and search through that the entirety of that recording uh, for any uh, point in time makes it far more intrusive uh, than than merely uh, watching someone for a limited period of time. And the court uh, describes how uh, just given the frailties of human observation and and memory uh, 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 and incident or detail could be missed by an individual agent watching uh, a, a suspect, but a recording anyone can go back to at any point in time uh, and, and pick, on, pick on details, dates, individuals, um, and, and access that information and use it for um, any kind of purpose, including, uh, uh, including obviously, a chill, uh, a chill on uh, constitutionally protected associations. For example, the court talks about um, uh, that 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 detail, that level of detail of recording of someone's life uh, exposes their family. Uh, personal associations, political, professional associations, just given who they're meeting and when they're meeting. Uh, the court comes up with a hypothetical about um, 
uh, uh, when a spouse is away, someone having a late night visitor who then leaves early the next morning, that kind of information can be used uh, for illegitimate purposes. And even if it's not used by the government, uh, it, it's still it's still recorded and and uh, maintained and 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 uh, uh, susceptible to uh, to misuse by others. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's pretty Orwellian. I guess if the if if this were not a search, there'd really be nothing to prevent the government from just putting these cameras everywhere, right? And uh, just reviewing them to at pretty low cost, which yeah. is the other part of it. If you if you are ha- uh, as the government, if you're uh, staking out uh, a location or following an individual, that's a high cost proposition. You, you tend to do it for a limited period of time. Here, for relatively low cost given the the technology at issue the government is capable of uh, maintaining this kind of surveillance for an extremely uh, long period of time eight months in this case and uh, uh, and and in fact in another case uh, the a court found that four weeks of GPS surveillance of a vehicle uh, was was too much in terms of uh, a search so eight months of a house seems to seems to be well beyond the line. Yeah, but this really goes, I think, to an an interesting cleavage that is emerging in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Where I think if you if you time traveled back to like 1995 and asked a Fourth Amendment scholar whether putting a camera on a post to film the front of someone's house was a search under the Fourth Amendment, they would uniformly have told you no. Uh, but what does seem to be, and I, you know, you, you can't fault the the district judge for this. I think he's discerning something that actually is happening in the Supreme Court's case law. Is in certain respects there seems to be a shift from just examining what the government is doing to examining what kind of information the government is gathering, uh, and whether that comes from kind of a a discomfort with technology, a discomfort with the the amount of information that can be stored and recalled, or just discomfort with the the increasing low cost of surveillance. That what the court is really concerned with in this opinion, I think it's picking up on certainly things that the Supreme Court has has said uh, matter to the analysis, is that this is creating a permanent record of everyone who comes and goes that can be recalled. Uh, and in an era of modern technology, I can certainly see why people are worried about that, and I understand why that's emerging in the jurisprudence. Uh, but I also think it's interesting in the sense that it would be completely foreign to someone who didn't know about uh, essentially the 21st century. Uh, that in a way, it suggests that the the reason this is a search uh, is that uh, the reason one thing would be a search and another would not be a search, your stakeout is a search, uh, Mr. 1995 guy, because you're taking just super good notes. And your notes are so good that you are gathering so much information that you could go back to your notes and you could misuse them, and your notes are therefore a search. And I think that would be just wild to, to someone who, again, was time traveling from 1994, but in an era of incredibly cheap storage, which I think matters in many ways more than the cheapness of the surveillance, uh, the sort of concern with government being able to gather and then process data about individuals is really becoming in in an extraordinarily rapid fashion a part of Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, and it will be interesting to see kind of how the courts go about hashing out these lines. I do think part of it, and you know, one thing that I think this decision may prove to be something of an outlier on is a lot of it does seem to have to do with the court's actual comfort with the technology, that if it's uh, cell phone tracking, if it's a GPS device on a car, uh, I think a lot of judges' intuitive reaction is, oh, well, nobody could possibly expect the government to be able to gather this information. Uh, And when it's a camera, I think a lot of judges' intuitive reaction is, oh, well, everybody knows there are cameras, and a camera's not really that different from a stakeout. And what the district court is doing here is is really trying to push past its sort of intuitive reaction to the technology and focus on what kind of technology it is uh, and move to a focus on the the actual kind of data. Uh, And the court is, I think, 
undeniably right as a practical matter that a complete record of when you are home, when you are gone, and who comes to visit you is more intrusive data than just where you happen to drive one particular car for a period of weeks. Yeah, there also seems to be kind of an implicit concern for the, like, what's the signal to noise ratio? Like, how much of the information that you're gathering is actually related to the underlying investigation, and how much of it is just details of the person's day-to-day -day life, and it, certainly at least here. Um, although, so the, the case is actually not clear about what they were arrested for, so I looked it up, and it, it was a drug trafficking thing. Um, so probably they were having people come to the, the house and buy drugs, or, what, or allegedly they were having people come to the, the house and buy drugs. Um, Don't defame anyone, Sherman. That's, that's true. Some people have pleaded guilty in this, this case, but we also know that people plead guilty when they haven't committed crimes. Um, <laughs> We're just going off the rails with that shot. Yeah, oh, man, <laughs> this is nuts. Uh, so uh, anyway, at least the the court here seems to have been concerned by the fact that the, the vast majority of the information that was being gathered was just totally unconnected to the actual. I think that's right. Uh, one other uh, point that's interesting in terms of looking at, uh, at this kind of question at, uh, in, d in different points of time, like uh, back in history, as the court looks at an analysis uh, going, back to, uh, uh, going back to the founding and, in fact, even before that, uh, talking about, well, uh, it, there were there were statutes passed uh, that uh, prohibited religious uh, uh, gatherings in private residences, and if um, and if there was if there were stakeouts of though of residences over again uh, prolonged periods of time, uh, back back then you you would again have the same kind of concerns about uh, intrusive government. Um, uh, uh, spying on constitutionally protected freedoms, uh, r religious, uh, associational, and others. So the technology definitely, and the and the cheapness of both surveillance and uh, storage is is at play here. But I think the values that the court is trying to to look to. Uh, uh, extend back further than than just the 21st century or the period we're in. Mm -hmm. Well, this is certainly not the last we're going to hear about this issue. I'm sure we're going to see more cases on this, and, and this case itself may end up going to a federal court of appeals. Well, guys, thank you for being with me this week. That's going to wrap things up for us. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. And uh, until next time, this is Short Circuit urging you to stay engaged. Mm -hmm.